Okay, so you did not come here to listen to me talk this morning. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Fox, who aside from being a movement disorders specialist and neurologist, is also the director of the Laboratory for Brain Network Imaging and Modulation, the associate director for the Berenson Allen Center for Non-Invasive Brain Stimulation, and the co-director for the Deep Brain Stimulation Program, who's going to be talking with us today about innovative um, brain imaging techniques used to diagnose and treat movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease. So thank you, Dr. Fox, for being here. All right. Let's see if this guy's working. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on a uh, Saturday morning to hear a little bit about the research that we're doing here at Beth Israel and, and how we think that research might lead to new treatments. Um, the main question and answer, as uh, Stephanie said, will be at the end, but, but please raise your hand and ask questions if there's something that I'm talking about that, that you don't understand as we go along. So I'm actually going to start a little bit with who I am um, and what my path has been and why I think brain circuits are going to be a key to developing new treatments for disorders like Parkinson's disease and dystonia. Uh, so I actually started off my career as an electrical engineer. Uh, I went to Ohio State University, majored in engineering, and focused on circuits. And one key thing I took away from that is that any piece of electrical equipment, no matter whether it's a computer or an iPhone or a stereo receiver, you're not going to fix it unless you have a wiring diagram. And that's step one. If there's something wrong with it, you need to know what's connected to what, what the different components are, and then you have a shot of figuring out why the stereo is not producing any sound or why the computer won't turn on. After electrical engineering, I went over uh, to Wash U in St. Louis to an MD PhD program. So this is a unique training program where you do both medical school and graduate school at the same time. And the whole point of this program is that in medical school, you learn how to take care of patients. And then in graduate school, you learn how to do science and do research. And the idea is that training people to put these two together will be important for developing new treatments. While I was doing my PhD uh, and learning about neuroscience, it was kind of a, a right place at the right time. So while I was in St. Louis was about the time that we developed special MRI sequences to see how the human brain is wired up. So I mentioned that you got to always start with a wiring diagram when you're an electrical engineer. We didn't have a wiring diagram for the human brain. We knew how animal brains were wired up, but we had no idea how the human brain was wired or it changed compared to animal brains. And so when I was in St. Louis, we developed special types of MRI scans. So this is the same MRI scanner that you go in to get an MRI of your knee or of your head. But rather than just look at the anatomy, we were able to look at the connectivity. So, for example, one type of scan is called diffusion tractography, where you put someone in a scanner, but rather than just look at a picture of the anatomy, you actually look at where water likes to diffuse in the brain. And it turns out water really likes to move along big connected fiber tracks and doesn't like to move across those fiber tracks. So just by looking at where water moves in the brain, you can actually reconstruct all of the anatomical connections in the human brain. That's what you see rotating here. That's a map of anatomical brain connectivity developed from fancy MRI scans that measure where water diffuses. An even bigger breakthrough was the ability to look at functional connectivity. So this is somebody laying in the scanner, and it's actually me laying in the scanner, um, just thinking about whatever it is I want to think about. Um, gee, how long am I going to have to lay on this scanner? Uh, I'm hungry. Uh, th this spot right here is I think I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but, but what we figured out is, is how to look at spontaneous fluctuations in brain activity. So every time you see a, a yellow spot appear, that brain region is going active. And every time you see a blue spot appear, that brain region is actually turning off. And we learned how to measure these patterns of spontaneous brain activity when someone is just sitting there in an MRI scanner. Now, the reason that that's an important breakthrough is it tells us not just what brain regions are connected based on these anatomical connections, but how they're functionally related to one another. What is the functional consequence of all these anatomical connections? 
And what we're able to do is see when this brain area turns on, all right, it's connected to these other brain areas, and sure enough, they turn on as well. And we've been able to use these different types of brain connectivity imaging techniques to map out who's connected to who and who's talking to who in the human brain. And this, on the neuroscience side, has been a giant leap forward. Um, now, instead of thinking about what function maps to what brain region, we can now talk about what function maps to what brain circuit. And that turns out to be a much more effective way to do neuroscience than trying to just map things to individual brain regions. I then went on and did my neurology residency here in Boston um, after I graduated medical school. And I started meeting a lot of patients with a lot of different brain diseases. Uh, today we're really going to focus in on movement disorders, but brain disease is a big, big problem. And it turns out that all brain diseases are diseases of brain circuits. Now, it turned out that all of these different patients that I met as I started my neurology residency, not a single one of them cared that we now have a wiring diagram of the human brain, right? What they wanted to know is, how are you going to help me? Um, I have epilepsy, and no medications have worked. I have Parkinson's tremor, and no medications have worked. How are you going to help me? And I mentioned before that, that these patients are not alone. Um, brain disease is actually the leading source of disability worldwide, bigger than cancer, bigger than AIDS. Just in the United States, the estimated cost of brain disease is around $760 billion per year. And we lack effective therapies for many of these patients. We have some good drugs. L-DOPA is a fantastic drug, but it doesn't fix everything. Um, and for some diseases, like Alzheimer's, we have essentially no drugs at all. So how are we going to use this brain connectome to solve some of these problems? Well, there is hope. And you might have seen these doom and gloom numbers before. It's actually very popular to talk about these numbers in the, in the media and in the press of, oh, woe is us, we've got to fix brain disease. And that's great because it means that, that the government is investing money in coming up with treatments and cures for these diseases. But there is good reason to be optimistic. And I'll give you a, a couple of these good reasons right here. So uh, this is Diaz. He's a 65-year-old history professor. And he's had severe Parkinson's tremor for about 12 years that has not responded to any medication. This is a patient of mine. Um, and this is him. And, and you can see that this is his tremor right there. And, and that tremor has been going on almost 24-7 while he's awake for 12 years. Um, he's tried six different Parkinson's medications. None of them have worked. Uh, he then came to us, and we put deep brain stimulation electrodes in a part of his brain called the subthalamic nucleus. And this was actually the first day that he got turned on. And I assure you the video is actually running right now. Um, and so this is the first time in 12 years that his hand is not shaking. Um, and you can see at the end of the video his, uh, his reaction to that. And so this is a success story. You can see it comes back a little bit when he gets emotional, right? This is a success story. We are actually able to fix certain brain problems. And the first time I ever saw a patient in medical school with deep brain stimulation electrodes get turned on, I knew what I wanted to do. And I knew that I wanted to leverage this success. If we can turn off tremor, what else can we fix? Here's another success story. This is JB. He's a 16-year-old high school student uh, with a disorder called dystonia, uh, where you get twisting, cramping movements uh, of your body and of your muscles. Um, some people get dystonia just of their neck, um, where they have twisting motions of their neck. Um, but it's actually a disease where it can come on young, and you can develop uh, twisting motions of your entire body. And so this started uh, when he was about 11 years old, with just a little bit of twisting of his foot. And then over a period of about five years, the twisting of his foot that just happened occasionally when he walked moved up his body. And you can see now this is, this is how he walks um, due to the severe dystonia. Now he went and saw our surgeon, Ron Alterman, actually when, when Ron was in New York. Uh, Ron put deep brain stimulation electrodes in a different part of, of his brain, an area called the globus pallidus, uh, turned the electrodes on, and, and this is the patient about six months later. 
And again, this is a very, very severe brain disease. Um, the natural history is for this to keep getting worse uh, to the point that he's wheelchair bound, not able to walk um, with early mortality uh, because of the severe twisting motion. And I'd like to say this has a happy ending, but my understanding is he's now in law school. <laughs> But the point is, is that uh, during my brain stimulation fellowship, I saw a lot of success stories. And so the question is, how can we leverage that success and bring these types of treatments to all of these patients, including patients with Parkinson's and dystonia that have symptoms that don't respond to brain stimulation therapies? And that's the goal of my lab. So as I stated, the goal is to translate this new neuroscience resource called the human brain connectome into new treatments for patients. So how do we go about doing that? Well, step one, and one of the things I'm going to spend most of the talk today focused on, is identifying the circuit. We have the wiring diagram, but we don't actually know which symptoms map onto which circuits that we can see with our wiring diagram. And that, that ends up being a tricky problem, but you're, you're not going to get anywhere with your treatments until you know where in the brain that symptom is coming from. And actually, I should, I should refine that comment for a moment. Uh, you can actually get somewhere with treatments not knowing where in the brain the problem comes from, but it's been a process of trial and error. So these two success stories that I showed you with the deep brain stimulation electrodes that had their, their symptom fixed by brain stimulation, the way we identified that target was trial and error. Literally, surgeons would go in and start cutting every single part of the nervous system until they found a spot that, that got rid of tremor. So when they went in, the first thing they did is actually cut the nerve coming out of the spinal cord. And it did stop tremor. It also stopped all other movements of the arm, and so the arm was paralyzed. They then moved up a little bit higher and put a lesion um, in the tracks coming from the motor cortex to the spinal cord. Same thing, arm was totally paralyzed. And they did this over and over again, trying to find a spot in the brain that would actually stop the tremor without making the arm paralyzed. And in fact, when they finally found a spot that would stop the tremor without paralyzing the arm, it was a, a, a mistake. Um, the patient was undergoing an operation, they were aiming at one area in the brain, the patient had a bleed in a different area of the brain, and when they woke up, their tremor was gone and they weren't paralyzed. That's where our treatments came from. So I, I shouldn't say that we, we have to identify the circuit. We can use a trial and error approach, and that has gotten us where we are today. But it seems like a really long way about uh, to, to get to effective treatments. And the trial and error approach has not worked for a lot of things like Alzheimer's disease. So we're trying to take a more scientific approach to identify these therapeutic targets to map symptoms to the brain circuits that are responsible for those symptoms and then develop our therapies. And actually our most effective tool for doing this throughout history has been brain lesions or patients with focal brain damage. And the reason that's so powerful is it's the only way that we can causally link an area of the human brain to a resulting symptom. Now we can do this really well in animals. Right? In animals, you can actually go in, lesion a certain part of the brain, see what happens to the animal, and map out very precisely what's responsible for what in a mouse brain or even in a monkey brain. Well, you can't do that in people. Um, so we have to rely on natural strokes or natural brain damage. So a patient that comes in that has a stroke and suddenly can't speak anymore. Well, we know that there is a causal link between the location in the brain where that patient had their stroke and speech. We've now mapped out speech to a specific spot in the brain based on a patient that had damage to that spot and can no longer speak. And if we actually repeat that process for three different patients, all of whom came in with vocal brain damage and an inability to speak, then we can map out their locations of brain damage and see where they intersect. And then we can say, aha, now we've nailed it. Now we know exactly the part of the human brain that's responsible for speech, and we know exactly the part of the human brain that we might need to intervene on when somebody comes in and can't speak. Right? But there's a big problem with this approach, and, and it's gotten us far. Right? We, we, this is literally the basis of the field of neurology, of neurosurgery, and of neuroscience, and of psychiatry, is patients with a lesion that had a deficit that gives us some insight to what in the brain does what.
However, this is how lesion mapping is supposed to work. Here's what actually happens if you take three patients with brain damage causing the same symptom, right? In every one of these cases, there is a causal link between the location of the patient's brain damage and the resulting symptom. But when you try and make the lesions line up across different patients, you're left scratching your head, right? Okay, which one of these spots is responsible for speech? Where do I want to intervene if a patient has a speech problem? And this is where the wiring diagram is a game changer, right? Because now we can take these locations of brain damage and test whether they map to one common brain circuit. Maybe speech isn't supposed to intersect in one spot. And maybe speech doesn't map to one brain region, but maybe it maps to one brain circuit. And that can be an anatomically connected circuit, or, and it turns out to be even more powerful, uh, a functionally connected circuit. All right, a set of brain regions that are all talking to each other based on patterns of spontaneous activity. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're using the wiring diagram and then patients that have strokes to figure out where symptoms map in the human brain. And once we do that, we can use that mapping to help other patients that have similar symptoms, but maybe their symptom comes from Parkinson's disease, not from stroke. So let me show you how we do this. And this is gonna you know, get a little technical and a little scientific for a minute, but I want you to understand the guts of how we're doing these circuit mappings. So what we do is we take a patient, and, and it's hard to see on this little screen, but this patient actually has a stroke right there, a little one, right in the middle of their brain. And this patient actually came in not with speech problems, but acute onset visual hallucinations. Right? And, uh, and this was actually, believe it or not, this was a 14-year-old girl that was driving in her car, and all of a sudden, bang. Uh, she looked out her window, and it looked like the entire countryside was being drawn in by crayon. Right? And then she looked at her chair over the passenger seat, and all of a sudden she saw a bunch of flowers growing out of, this, out of the seat of the car, right? So she came into the neurology clinic saying, all right, what, what's going on here? Um, I know that this is not supposed to suddenly happen like this. And sure enough, she, she had had a stroke at 14 years old. But we want to understand why a stroke in this spot in the brain, which as far as we know has nothing to do with vision, could have resulted in severe visual hallucinations. And so here's what we do. We turn to our wiring diagram called the human connectome. And we look at this spot in the brain, and then we go to our database of a thousand subjects that have had these special types of MRI scans. And we actually look at the spontaneous fluctuations in brain activity that are occurring at that spot in the brain in normal, healthy individuals, right? We can't see what spontaneous activity is occurring in, in this patient because that part of the brain is now dead. So we have to go to our database, our connectome database. We then can ask what other areas in the brain are connected to the spot where she had her stroke. So we now turn the lesion into what we call a lesion network, a set of brain regions that are all connected to that lesion location. It's the circuit. And we see that there are areas here in red and in orange that are fluctuating with the spot in the brain where she had her stroke. So every time this spot in the brain goes up, the areas in red tend to go up. And then we also see other areas that every time the area where she had her stroke goes down, other areas in the brain tend to go up. And again, this is just the functional wiring diagram of the human brain, but applied to her specific stroke. All right. Now that we turn the lesion into a lesion network, now we can begin to make sense of things. Let me show you how. So, uh, here is actually two other patients, and we had 23 other patients that all had the same thing. They all had a stroke that caused acute onset visual hallucinations. And all of these patients had a stroke in a different location, right? Just like the speech thing, it doesn't line up, right? You're, you're looking at it, you're scratching your head, you're saying, these have to be telling us something about where visual hallucinations are coming from, but man, I, 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 for life of me, can't figure out where. But once you turn each one of these lesions into a lesion network, again, a set of brain areas that are connected to the damaged part of the brain, all of a sudden things start to line up and make sense. And so even though these strokes are all in different locations, they're all part of the same brain circuit. And it turns out that all of these strokes that cause visual hallucinations 
all of them were connected to the spot in the brain that we know is involved in visual imagery. All right? So what, what happened in these cases is they had a stroke. As a natural consequence of the way the human brain is wired up, this part of the brain that's involved in visual imagery became hyperactive. Right? And we were able to link all of these different strokes in all these different locations to the same circuit that results in hyperactivity in visual imagery. And now all of a sudden, visual hallucinations started to make sense. But more importantly, now we've mapped the symptom of visual hallucinations to a brain circuit. And so if we need to go in and intervene on visual hallucinations, now we have a target. And sure enough, uh, people have actually held big electrode magnets over this spot of the brain involved in visual imagery and suppressed visual hallucinations. So does this work for movement disorders? Um, we're here today to talk about Parkinson's, dystonia, other types of movement disorders, not necessarily visual hallucinations. That, yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, great point and great question. So uh, the question is, I said that we held a big, big electromagnet over this area of the brain involved in visual hallucinations. And so once we've identified the therapeutic target, once we've mapped the symptom to a circuit, how do we want to go in and modulate that circuit? And, and I showed you some examples with deep brain stimulation electrodes. That's one way to go after the circuit. But there are actually ways to go after the circuit from the outside of the skull and modulate the circuit non-invasively. Um, there are also lesions. You can actually go in and burn a hole in that circuit to help certain symptoms. And people are doing that right now for tremor, for example. And so I'll talk about a little bit at the end, once we've mapped a symptom to a circuit, how we go after that circuit therapeutically. But, but the short answer is we have lots of options. And in fact, our options are constantly expanding because a new neuromodulation technology is being developed almost every couple of weeks. And so once we know what circuit the symptom comes from, now we can look at all of our different tools for modulating that brain circuit and see which one is most convenient and which one is most effective for helping the symptoms. Very good question. All right, so let's dig into movement disorders. Um, and it turns out that this premise, this idea that you can take areas of brain damage and map them to a brain circuit has worked for every symptom we've tried. So this is a movement disorder called hemichorea, right? It's very common in Huntington's disease. So chorea is extra movements or dance-like movements. And so patients with Huntington's um, very early on will, will develop a little bit of extra movements. It, it's very common uh, or very similar to a dyskinesia uh, for anybody that might be more familiar with that. But it's a extra dance-like movement. And again, a lot of patients with Huntington's have this movement, but you can get it from stroke. And so a patient can have a stroke and rather than come in with a paralyzed arm, they can actually come in with an arm going like this. Um, but just like every symptom, here are three different patients, all of whom had brain damage in three completely different locations um, that have this hemichorea, or these flailing arm movements. But they were all part of one brain circuit in, in the sense that every single one of them had brain damage that was connected to a spot in the brain called the putamen. Right? And that's actually a spot in the brain that we already had linked to flailing arm movements uh, through, believe it or not, patients with diabetes. So if you have severe diabetes and you decide to just stop taking your diabetes meds, for whatever reason, that spot in the brain will light up and you will start having these flailing arm movements, just like a patient with stroke, just like a patient with Huntington's. Right? Now again, the take home point is that this is a symptom. We really didn't know where it came from. We didn't know if it came from the same brain circuit across different diseases. And based on focal lesions and that wiring diagram of the human brain, we could figure out what circuit it's coming from. And it seems to be the same circuit for the same symptom, independent of whether that symptom is caused by stroke, caused by not taking your diabetes meds, or caused by Huntington's disease. We apply this tool to a symptom called freezing of gait. Um, so this is most common in Parkinson's disease uh, as the disease progresses, where patients try to take a step and their foot just doesn't move. Um, or they try to turn and their foot just doesn't move. 
uh, it can be a very disabling, very debilitating symptom, and it, beca it can become refractory to all of our medications and all of our current therapies, including deep brain stimulation. So it's a very, very big problem in Parkinson's disease. In addition, there are patients that have strokes that cause freezing of gait. Now, they give us insight into where this symptom might be coming from. So sure enough, we found a bunch of patients that had lesion-induced freezing of gait, mapped out, and this is just three patients, but we found about 20, mapped out the location of the brain injury that led to freezing of gait. And again, it's all over the place. Each one of these patients had damage to a very different spot in the brain. But using the connectome, we could figure out that all of the patients with strokes that caused this horrible symptom were all connected to a very specific spot in the cerebellum, it turns out, the back part of your brain. And it turns out that, that this part of the cerebellum has actually got a name. It's been called the cerebellar locomotor region. Um, because when you put people in a scanner and you have them try and do walking in the scanner, that's an area that lights up. So it starts to make a lot of sense that if you have a stroke to this circuit that's involved in walking, then you can have a symptom like freezing a gait. Again, now that we know the circuit, we can begin to think through new treatments aimed at that circuit. And then one of the uh, students in my lab wanted to go after a very interesting syndrome called alien limb. Um, now, people can have atypical forms of Parkinson's that, that cause this symptom. What this symptom is, is it's a, a, a patient will be sitting there in the office and their, their arm will reach out. They might grab your pen off your desk or start playing with papers or start fiddling with the buttons on their shirt. And you ask them, oh, wait, wait, why, why are you grabbing my pen? Oh, I'm, I'm not doing it. That's, my arm is doing that. But I'm, I'm not in control of my arm. It's just it's doing things on its own. And you can see where they came up with the phrase alien limb, right? No, nobody's ever said, I think an alien is controlling my limb. But, but the limb is doing things that the, uh, the patient doesn't feel in control of, right? Now, as a neuroscientist, that's very, very interesting um, because that taps into something that we call agency. What makes you feel like you have control of your own body? Um, it actually taps into deeper philosophical questions about free will. And that's why Dr. Darby got interested in this question. Um, and what he did is he mapped out 50 patients that all had strokes that caused this bizarre alien limb phenomenon. All of them were connected to a specific spot in the brain. It's actually called the precuneus. And we think that's responsible for our feelings of agency. Right? Um, and again, uh, the reason we think that we're right is, believe it or not, when you're undergoing brain surgery, Neurosurgeons will take an electrode and stimulate different parts of your brain just to make sure they don't cut out something important. And for the most part, they're looking for spots in the brain that make you move, and they don't want to cut that out because they don't want you to be paralyzed after the operation. Or they're looking for spots in the brain that make you unable to talk. Again, they don't want to cut that out because they don't want you to have speech problems afterwards. But every once in a while, they'll stimulate a spot in the brain that causes something weird, um, where all of a sudden the person will move like with a really complicated movement and say, well, I, I, I didn't mean to do that. What, what did you do to me, right? Or they'll move and they'll feel like um, they have control of something that they don't. But you can manipulate these feelings of agency in the operating room, stimulating different spots. And it turns out that those spots that surgeons have stimulated lined up exactly with our circuit that we think is responsible for these feelings of agency that we mapped out using alien limb, right? Like I said, we've been very successful using this technique to map different symptoms to different brain circuits. But I'm going, I'm going to go into a couple in detail that I thought would be interesting to this audience. And one of the first symptoms we turned to was Parkinsonism. Right? We all think we know where Parkinson's comes from. Uh, you've all been taught that there are dopamine neurons in, the, in an area of the brain called the substantia nigra. Parkinson's disease affects those dopamine neurons, and as they begin to die, you manifest the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Stiffness, slowness of movement, tremor, uh, stooped gait, shuffling gait. And this is all due to these, these dopamine neurons. Well, that's true. That is one way you can get Parkinson's. And when you get Parkinson's from that, we can actually give you dopamine medications that help a lot of the symptoms. But believe it or not, you can also get those same exact symptoms, what we call Parkinsonism, from other diseases. 
Um, some of them are cousins of Parkinson's, things like multiple systems atrophy or progressive supernuclear palsy. These are neurodegenerative diseases that can look a lot like Parkinson's, but when you give the patients dopamine, they don't tend to get better. And Parkinson's can be caused by a focal stroke. So these are all patients uh, that had a stroke that then developed the same symptoms of Parkinson's. Tremor, stiffness, slowness of movement, shuffling gait. Now again, these patients with strokes should be able to help us figure out what circuit in the brain is responsible for these symptoms. Now we were expecting to get the substantia nigra. That's what everybody in the field of neuroscience thinks Parkinson's must come from, and we didn't. Um, we actually got a brain, so we, we, this is the substantia nigra right here. And so it was part of the circuit, but it wasn't the key spot in the circuit. A lot of these lesions were, were, were connected to the substantia nigra, but, but a bunch of them weren't. And actually, the key spot in the brain was a spot called the clostrum. Uh, it's a brain region that actually nobody knows what it does. And so we scratched our head and said, well, we're never going to be able to publish this paper. Nobody's going to believe this. Um, everybody knows Parkinson's comes from the substantia nigra. But as we thought harder about it, it started to make sense. Um, and I'll just mention that this was very specific to lesions that cause Parkinsonism. Um, in other words, the one spot in the brain that was connected to lesions that cause Parkinson's, but not connected to lesions that cause lots of other things, was this clostrum spot. Right? And, and again, we scratched our heads for a long time, but as we started to dig into the literature, there seemed to be supporting evidence for this. So very few people have ever looked at this brain region. But if you do look at it, it seems like it has abnormalities very, very early on in Parkinson's disease. In fact, before you actually see abnormalities in the substantia nigra. And then more importantly, we already know that Parkinson's can't be all about dopamine because there are patients that get Parkinson's or Parkinson's-like symptoms, and the dopamine doesn't make them better. Um, more importantly, we know that there are symptoms of Parkinson's that don't respond to dopamine. And so what this actually means is that you can take this red spot in the clostrum, look at everything that red spot in the clostrum is connected to, and identify a brain circuit for Parkinsonism. And, and by definition, this brain circuit that I'm showing here in red encompasses all these different lesion locations that have ever been shown to cause Parkinsonism. Right? That's how we found the circuit in the first place. But what was interesting is this red circuit also lined up really well with other causes of Parkinson's. So what you see here is the red circuit lining up really well with the stuff in blue and green. And blue and green is where patients with regular run-of-the-mill Parkinson's disease have brain atrophy or brain shrinkage. So it lined up almost perfectly with our circuit. But more importantly, patients with progressive supernuclear palsy and progress patients with multiple systems atrophy, these, these nasty cousins of Parkinson's disease, they had areas of brain shrinkage that also lined up with our circuit. And so, yeah, please. Yeah. And yet, does it, the, the region should be a little larger in the colostrum. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, so um, uh, that's one thing that's, so the, the question was, gee, that looks like this spot in the brain is awfully tiny. Um, how is that little tiny spot connected to all of this red stuff here? Um, and, and that's the, the magic of the brain's wiring diagram is that in the brain, almost everything is connected to everything else at a certain level. It might be not just one connection, but it might be region A is connected to region B, and region B is connected to region C, and region C is connected to region D. Uh, I've got the song, The Hip Bones Connected to the... <laughs> um, but, but, but that's how even a small region, like that little red spot in the colostrum, can be connected to so many things. Yeah. So is this relevant for therapy? Right? That's really what this is all getting to. Um, this is fun neuroscience, but, but we really don't care unless this has got therapeutic relevance. And so for our Parkinson's circuit, we, we looked at two things. Right? One is we wanted to understand why some of these patients with Parkinson's from stroke get better with, with dopamine, with L-DOPA, and some patients didn't. 
And again, that feels very similar to there's some parts of Parkinson's that get better with L-dopa and some parts that don't. And it turns out that the people that had strokes that got better with L-dopa compared to the people that had strokes that didn't get better with L-dopa were connected to the putamen. And that's where all the L-dopa neurons project to. So it, it kind of made perfect sense and aligned up with why patients with the same symptoms might not respond to the same medication. Right? It's all about connectivity and it's all about what part of the circuit you're hitting and how you're hitting the circuit. And then even more importantly, we looked at deep brain stimulation response. Now nobody's ever had deep brain stimulation electrodes inserted into the colostrum. So we have no idea what that would do um, and whether that'd be a good thing or a bad thing. But lots of patients have had DBS electrodes in an area of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus. That's the spot in the brain uh, that the patient had their DBS electrodes in for the first video that I showed you. And just like connectivity is critically important for lesions, connectivity is critically important for deep brain stimulation sites. So even though nobody's ever had an electrode in the colostrum, what we could do is look at a, bu a bunch of patients that had electrodes put elsewhere in the brain and see if they were connected to the colostrum. And sure enough, they were. And the more connected your electrode was to the colostrum, you better, the better you did. So again, it's, it's beginning to, to hunt down and figure out whether or not this thing that we found that didn't make any sense, that nobody expected, whether or not that could actually be a new therapeutic target to help Parkinson's, but more importantly, to help the symptoms of Parkinson's that don't respond to L-DOPA. Because if it's not a circuit that's all about dopamine, that opens up totally new avenues for trying to treat the symptoms. Yeah, please. Yeah, so, so um, the, the question is, is um, thinking through this connectivity and you know, how many connections away are different things, right? And the, um, the imaging tool that we use actually doesn't care if it's one connection or two connections or three connections. And it doesn't care if it's connected this way and then also connected this way and then also connected this way. What it looks at is the functional consequences of all of those different connections, right? And so what it really looks at is if this brain region is going to go up, what's going to happen over here as a consequence of all these different connections. So in this case, with the deep brain stimulation electrodes, we think that that's shutting down a spot in the brain. And so it's saying, okay, if, if my DBS electrode shuts down this spot in the brain, do I think anything's going to happen in the colostrum based on all of these different connections? Right? So it's, it's a little hard to think through. It's a, it's a lot simpler to think, oh, region A is connected to region B, and the more connected it is, the more effect you have. Um, but the reality of how we use the wiring diagram of the human brain and how we use the connectome to study these questions, it's a little bit more complicated than just region A to region B, right? It's, it's, it's encompassing the complexity of the fact that everything in the human brain is connected to everything else in the human brain. And so A might be connected to B, but it might be connected through region C or also through region D and E. And, and in the end, there are so many different connections that if I actually put up the wiring diagram, uh, it, it would be horrifying. And, and in fact, uh, they, they do this to medical students. So when they teach medical students about Parkinson's disease, um, they put up a wiring diagram of what we call the basal ganglia. So lots of different regions deep in the brain that we think are involved in Parkinson's. And there's about seven or eight of them. And then they draw little wires in between these seven and eight brain regions. And then they draw other wires. And every year, they've added a couple wires. I'm not joking. And so now when you put up the wiring diagram of the human basal ganglia, the poor medical students just throw up their hands and say, you got, I can't memorize that. That's impossible. But, but it, it highlights the complexity of the human brain, is that in the end, when you even take seven or eight brain regions and you try and figure out who's connected to who, there are more connections there that you were missing. And you keep on adding complexity, adding complexity to the point that that anatomical wiring diagram itself ceases to be useful. And now what you really want to know is, if I suppress activity here or excite this brain region here, what's going to happen to the rest of the circuit and what's going to happen to the regions I care about? And so it's a long-winded way. What, what's that? It means more in the sense of greater brain activity, right? So if I put an electrode in the colostrum and I record the brain activity there,
and then I turn on my DBS electrodes in a different spot in the brain, the connectivity between the spot where my electrodes are and the claustrum is going to predict what's going to happen to that brain activity in the claustrum. All right. Um, I also want to go into cervical dystonia. Um, now, there's probably not many people in the audience here that are suffering from dystonia, but this is actually uh, also a symptom of Parkinson's disease. So dystonia is, is similar to what I showed you earlier um, with that gentleman uh, with the twisted trunk that had trouble walking that got better with the DBS. But dystonia can take many forms. Um, patients with Parkinson's disease will often develop dystonia of their toes or dystonia of their foot. Um, they'll have to get Botox to go ahead and, and release the toes. Um, sometimes it responds to L-DOPA, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, patients with Parkinson's disease or patients without Parkinson's disease can get dystonia of their neck, um, what we call cervical dystonia, um, where their head will start twisting to one side, or sometimes their head will be pulled down or pulled, pulled back. And again, it's, it's a very disabling symptom uh, when it appears. And so we wanted to, to study cervical dystonia. So again, these are all patients that had strokes that caused cervical dystonia, this painful twisting motion of the neck. Right? And it turns out that all of those different areas of brain damage were all connected to now not just one spot, but two spots. All of those strokes had to be connected to a specific spot in the cerebellum. It was actually, it's a different spot than what we saw for the freezing of gait. And they had to all be connected to sensory cortex, the part of the brain that, that actually lights up when you just feel something. Um, and that was pretty exciting to us. And the reason it was exciting is that I showed you earlier the visual hallucination circuit, where the lesions that cause visual hallucinations were all negatively connected to visual cortex. Well, now all of a sudden we're seeing lesions causing a twisting of the neck all being connected in the same way to sensory cortex. And so the uh, implication of this, and this was very provocative, is could dystonia be a type of hallucination? In other words, is the reason that these patients' neck is twisting to the side like this um, because they're hallucinating, they actually think that their neck is straightforward um, when actually it's being twisted to the side. And it turns out that, that that might make a lot of sense. So one of the crazy things about cervical dystonia is you can take a couple fingers and touch very lightly your cheek, and all of a sudden your head straightens out. It's called a sensory trick. And nobody knows why it works. It's one of those mysteries of neurology. But it sounds a lot like a hallucination. So if you're having visual hallucinations, they get worse at the end of the day when the light gets bad. And if you turn the lights up bright in your house, the visual hallucinations tend to get better. It's the same thing. You change the sensory input, and all of a sudden the hallucination has to reset itself. The cervical dystonia resolves, the visual hallucinations resolve. Now again, what this means by having connectivity to these two different spots is that we can use these two spots to define our network. So in purple here, and sorry I keep switching the colors on you, uh, different postdocs like different colors for their brain circuits. <laughs> but, but in purple here is all the spots in the brain that are connected to both the cerebellum and to the sensory cortex, right? So this is our network of brain regions that if you get a stroke in, in the purple areas here, and you can see all of our strokes in red overlaid, then you're gonna be at high risk for this painful twisting uh, motion of your neck, right? And this is just to show, uh, this is a complicated slide. This is to show that um, this same circuit that we identified based on patients with focal brain damage is actually abnormal in patients with regular run-of-the-mill cervical dystonia. So patients that develop this twisting motion of their neck, but they don't have a stroke. And so it's just showing that the same circuit that's responsible for cervical dystonia caused by lesions it's the same circuit that's responsible for cervical dystonia when you don't have a stroke at all, and it's caused by, we don't know what, genetics, Parkinson's disease, something like that. But again, is this a therapeutic target? Does this have any therapeutic relevance? And what we did is we partnered with a team in Germany that was looking at the connectivity profile of deep brain stimulation electrodes that help dystonia. So just like that patient that you saw in that earlier video. And what we could do is say, all right, we have a circuit that we think is responsible for dystonia based on lesions that cause dystonia. How well does that match up with the connections of your DBS electrodes that are making dystonia better? And so 
here's our pattern of cervical dystonia. Here's their pattern for deep brain stimulation electrodes. And you can see that they line up almost perfectly. So again, the circuit that we mapped out based on lesions that cause the symptom is the exact same pattern of connections that you need to hit with your DBS electrode to make the symptom better. All right, and I'm going to go into one more example here, um, which is tremor relief. And the reason I like to end with this one is it's got really obvious therapeutic relevance. And it turns out that not every stroke is bad for you. Most strokes are not good for you at all, right? I, I don't recommend that anybody go out and get a stroke. <laughs> but, but in these 11 cases, it turned out to be a good thing. So these were all uh, patients with severe essential tremor. Um, so Parkinson's tremor tends to happen when you're just sitting there at rest. Essential tremor tends to happen whenever you use your hand for anything. When you try to write, when you try to drink uh, a cup of coffee. And, and essential tremor can get so bad that you actually can't feed yourself uh, because your hands are shaking so severely. And these are 11 patients that had essential tremor and then they had a stroke. And it turned out that the stroke was one of the best things that ever happened to them because their essential tremor went away. All right. Now, these 11 patients should be able to tell us something really important about where the brain circuit is that we need to intervene on to fix essential tremor. But again, where do you go? Whose stroke do you want to imitate to try and fix essential tremor in other patients that have essential tremor that should be able to benefit from this knowledge? You have no idea, and that's why we had our process of trial and error that I was describing earlier to try and get rid of tremor. But now that we have a wiring diagram, we can say, okay, where do these 11 cases line up? Are they all part of one connected brain circuit? And of course, you know the answer is yes at this point, otherwise I wouldn't be showing you the slides. Um, but all of these lesions were connected to a specific spot in the thalamus and another specific spot in the cerebellum. Well, when we saw this, we got really excited because here's the spot in the thalamus that all of our lesions were connected to. And here is the spot where we put our deep brain stimulation electrodes to make tremor better. Again, the spot that we've identified through trial and error over a course of four decades. Um, and here's the intersection between the two. It overlapped exactly. It was, exact, it was the same pinpoint spot in the brain that we now know is effective for essential tremor. And so that's exactly where we put our deep brain stimulation electrodes to make essential tremor better. So again, it, it's just proof of concept that by mapping out the brain circuits responsible for these symptoms, we're identifying circuits that you can intervene on to make the symptom better. And this is just all of the stuff that we're working on right now, right? So this principle applies to movement disorders, but applies to lots of other things. Uh, it applies to amnesia uh, that actually was just published last week. So we have a human memory circuit now for the first time. Uh, it applies to addiction. We have lesions that actually get rid of your addiction. We're using those to build up a circuit target for addiction. Um, believe it or not, one of my postdocs is going after spirituality and religiosity. Uh, we can predict if you're gonna come out of a tumor resection surgery more or less religious than you went into it, right? So again, this is just fun stuff, but emphasizing that brain circuits and having a wiring diagram of the human brain is unlocking mysteries that we've been scratching our heads over for a really long time. Um, I'm actually gonna skip this because I wanna get to your questions, but this is a, a movement disorder that's a very disabling type of tremor that we don't have good treatments for. Um, and we're in the process of mapping that circuit out for that specific type of tremor to try and figure out where to put our electrodes. But I wanna jump ahead to what we do once we've identified the circuit. And this gets, you know, gets to the question from the audience earlier of, all right, what do we do to, to fix the circuit once we've mapped it out? And we've got different tools. Um, this is just a, a video of deep brain stimulation electrodes in one of our patients. Um, and you can see here, the region that we were targeting uh, in green, the subthalamic nucleus, right? But what the connectum is doing and what the circuit mappings are doing are changing our therapeutic target from thinking about a brain region there in green to thinking about a brain circuit, right? And so now we're not just targeting the region, we're targeting a spot in and around that region that hits all of these connections that we think are important for making the symptom better. Again, we need to hit the circuit, not just a region.
And we think that's going to make brain, brain stimulation better for the things we already use deep brain stimulation for, but open up the possibility of treating symptoms that it doesn't work for, like freezing a gait or memory problems. So how do we, mod how do we modulate the circuit, right? I mentioned that there is a new technology coming out every other week of different ways to manipulate and modulate human brain circuits. But these are the two dominant ones, right? These are the two that are FDA approved right now to go in and modulate human brain circuits. I showed you a lot about deep brain stimulation. Uh, the number one use of that is for Parkinson's disease, but you also saw how well it can work for dystonia. Uh, it works great for essential tremor. And then believe it or not, it's, a, it's approved for obsessive comp compulsive disorder, a psychiatric disorder. And then there's also a non-invasive form of brain stimulation that we also do called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's a big electromagnet that we hold on the outside of the scalp. And we can use that to treat a lot of different symptoms. But the big one is depression. That's its big FDA approval. Um, it's also approved for obsessive compulsive disorder and migraine. But it can also help symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Now again, if I'm right, if our therapeutic target is a brain circuit, then we should be able to predict who's getting better and who's not getting better based on whether or not we hit the circuit or not. And so these are all different patients in different colors that had deep brain stimulation. And again, no matter how good the surgeon is, and I can say Ron Alterman is very, very good, he doesn't get the electrodes in exactly the same spot every time in every patient. It's not possible. Patients have slightly different anatomy, um, and there's variability in where those electrodes end up. Now, it turns out that you can use that variability to figure out what connections are most important for DBS response. And so you can build a wiring diagram or a circuit diagram just like we built from lesions, and these are all the connections that you need to hit to make Parkinson's motor symptoms better. And the more that you hit those connections, the better patients get. And we actually validated this circuit target by going to a completely different DBS center in Germany and saying, okay, let's see if we can predict which one of your patients got better based on whether or not you hit this circuit. And sure enough, we could. Now, this is important not just for making Parkinson's symptoms better, but also avoiding side effects. So one of the side effects that we're really scared about with deep brain stimulation surgery is thinking and memory. We know that we can make tremor better, we know that we can make stiffness better, but every once in a while, we have someone whose thinking and memory gets worse after they've undergone DBS. And it's one of the reasons that people get scared away from DBS, because the last thing they want is to have a problem with their thinking and memory. Well, it turns out you can use the same approach to identify what circuit should we not hit. In other words, what circuit, if we hit it, seems to be responsible for, for thinking and memory decline? and we can build a circuit up that we want to avoid. And we actually took this circuit, and again, I, I partner a lot with Germany because they're really good at keeping track of all their DBS patients. They've got wonderful databases. But we could go back and screen their database and say, do any of the DBS patients have electrodes that are connected to this circuit? Um, and sure enough, some of them did, and those were the patients that were having the memory and the cognitive problems. And they're actually in the process of bringing those patients back right now and reprogramming their electrodes to try and avoid this circuit. And so where the future of DBS is going is not just, here's the circuit we need to hit to fix this symptom, this symptom, and this symptom, but here's the circuits we need to make sure we also avoid while we do it. And we can identify exactly what spot hits the connections that we want to hit and avoids the connections that we want to avoid. And the same thing works for non-invasive brain stimulation, for that transcranial magnetic stimulation I told you about. And again, the big thing we use that for here at Beth Israel is for depression. But we can, again, test whether or not hitting the connections that we think are most important predicts who gets better and who doesn't. Um, and, and sure enough, we were able to predict who's getting better based on which connections we're hitting. Um, turns out that those same sets of connections predicted who gets better in Australia. Um, so again, this idea that you have to hit the circuit is holding up across actually multiple continents at this point. And the exciting part is once you know the circuit, you can optimize the therapy. So with transcranial magnetic stimulation, we actually have no idea where the best place is to hold this electromagnet over patients' heads. We're guessing. Now, we're, we're, we're guessing well enough that people get better, but not everybody does. But once you've mapped out the circuit, 
Now you can pinpoint the exact spot on the circuit that you want to stimulate to try and make that symptom better. And then I mentioned uh, before that there are new stimulation technologies constantly coming out. This is just one of the technologies that, that was being developed in my lab. And it's actually a swim cap, a neoprene swim cap that you put on your head that stimulates an entire brain circuit simultaneously. Because if, if the, the therapeutic target's actually a brain circuit, not a brain region, well, why are we sticking our electrodes in just one brain region? or holding our electromagnetic coil over just one brain region, maybe we should stimulate the entire circuit simultaneously. And so you can actually do that with multifocal electrode arrays. Um, think of it as EEG in reverse, right? Where you stimulate with really weak electrical currents to change the excitability of an entire brain circuit. And this was just a first test, trying to increase the excitability of the motor circuit. And the reason we went after the motor circuit is, one, it's really important for things like Parkinson's disease, but two, we can actually measure what effect we have on the motor circuit um, very easily. And so in red is what happens with standard forms of stimulation. If you just stimulate one brain region, you do have an effect on the region that you stimulated within the motor circuit, but you don't have effect on any other regions in that motor circuit. Well, my patients with Parkinson's don't usually want me to just fix one hand. They want me to fix both sides, right? So when we stimulated with this swim cap and hit the entire circuit simultaneously, the effects were multiplied. Um, and the effects were present throughout the entire circuit. So again, it's just an example of how you can take this circuit approach and use it to begin to think through and develop new therapies. So again, the ultimate goal is to translate this new neuroscience resource, this human brain connectome, into new therapies, both for patients with movement disorders, but also patients without movement disorders, because it's the same premise that holds true across different uh, brain problems and across neurology and psychiatry. And so I want to acknowledge a couple of people. First, uh, the scientists who built the connectome. So I'm what they call a translational researcher. There are basic science researchers that do things like build a wiring diagram of the human brain. And then there are clinical researchers that test out different therapies and run drug trials and say, does this drug work or does this DBS procedure work? And I'm in the middle. My job is to translate this neuroscience resource being built by basic scientists all over the world into something that becomes a clinical trial that can now be tested um, by clinicians that, that do that type of thing. Second, I want to thank my patients. Um, my patients motivate what problems I go after. Uh, the reason I'm so focused on a symptom like freezing a gate is because that's the symptom my patients come in complaining to me about. And if you don't see the patients or give lectures to the patients, then you don't actually know what the problems are that you need to be addressing. Uh, obviously, all of the work was done by my students. I get to sit in my office and wait while they bring brilliant insights to me, and then I sign off of them. And then obviously my mentors. Uh, there are a lot of brilliant people around that are continuing to help teach me how to do this type of thing. Um, and then finally, funding, uh, which is critical. Uh, we've been very generously supported by a lot of different funding agencies, including the National Institute of Health. But a lot of the projects I showed you were actually funded by individual donors. Um, so the whole cervical dystonia project was somebody that has a daughter with dystonia. And they said, hey, it seems like you have a pretty cool platform for identifying therapeutic targets. Can you do dystonia? Yeah, we can. I just have to hire a student to do it. Um, so again, that's critical. No research happens without support of, of, of the donors. And at this time, I'll, I'll open it up for questions.